Welcome again to the Word of God ministry coming to you from St. John's Lutheran Church on 2415 Silas Creek Parkway in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It is always just such a joy for me to be able to, to speak to you um, the wonderful and encouraging words of, of God, and I know that um, he promises that he does bless us um, when we hear his word. Um, so thank you for uh, those of you who are watching. Um, I want to apologize to my St. John's family for missing church last Sunday. It's only the second Sunday in 30 years that I was laid up and couldn't do uh, uh, Sunday service. But um, I'm, I'm very thankful to the Lord for that. He has just blessed me with tremendous health, you know, as I've served in the ministry over the years. So I praise him and thank him for that. And, um, uh, you know, pray that uh, I'll put this uh, little incident of kidney stones um, in the past. Uh, I want to give a, a message, a shout out to my grandson, Jacob, this, today. Um, Jacob, I'm sorry we didn't get up to see you this last week or two. We were going to come up for Olivia's birthday, but I haven't been feeling well. And um, I hope we can come up as soon as I'm feeling better. But I just wanted to remind you that I love you and that you are always my best buddy. Well, let's get started. <clears throat> we begin um, our service, our time in the Word, with confession of sin. And someone might ask, why does the Lutheran Church, why do we confess our sins every time we get together for, for worship? And the simple answer to that is, we sin every week. And so whenever we come before the Lord, we come remembering that we are sinners, confessing those sins, but at the same time then rejoicing in God's announcement to us that our sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. So we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So then we confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. For we have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And so we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, amen. Dear friends, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for Jesus' sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, it's my joy to announce to you today that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this Sunday is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, and we're going to read verses 4 through 9. And uh, in this passage, um, we are reminded that, uh, that we are uh, as clay in the potter's hand, and we are formed by our Creator God. Beginning in verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help of those who gladly do right, and you remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are even like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins are swept away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So do not be angry beyond measure, Lord, and do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look on us, we pray, Lord, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is taken from the New Testament letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. And Paul's giving Timothy some instructions for Timothy's ministry 
um, as Paul's uh, writing this letter before he uh, went to his death in Rome. He says, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands upon you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Holy Gospel this week, we're taking from the Gospel of John in the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 12. Uh, And this is the story of when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet that Thursday night, um, the night when they celebrated uh, that first communion together uh, before he went to the cross on Friday. John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, beginning in verse 12. And so when Jesus had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Suppose you decide that your goal in life is to be a painter. How would you go about learning how to be a good painter? You could read about great painters, you could study art and art history. There is some book learning that would help, but probably the best way to learn how to be a good painter is to find someone who is a good painter and to learn from them. Suppose you decide you want to become a great teacher. How would you go about learning to be a good teacher? Again, you could read books on teaching, you can take courses on how to teach, there is some book learning But a far better way is to learn from someone who already is a good teacher. St. Paul had a problem in the early church. Lots of Jews and Greeks were being converted to the Christian faith from paganism and from false religions. So Paul had to teach them what Christians believe. He had to teach them the content of what Christians believe about God, about the Trinity, about Jesus, about salvation, about faith. All of his letters, especially the book of Romans, teach what Christians should believe. That's the book learning part. However, Paul also had to teach these new Christians how to be a Christian how to live, look, sound, and act as a follower of Jesus. And so what was Paul's solution? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you have called us to faith in Jesus Christ and the blessings of forgiveness uh, that are ours and eternal life that awaits us. Bless us now through this word that we might be in some small way this day changed to be a little bit more like Jesus. To his glory and in his name we pray. Amen. You know, I love the Bible's reminders to, to tell us that we should be like Jesus. And I think it's a really powerful discipline that can change our lives when we begin to ask ourselves throughout the day and in every circumstance, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus serve? How would Jesus sacrificially give? How would Jesus act? What would Jesus say? And how would he say it? In our second lesson, Paul wrote, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. But the simple truth of the matter is there's no way, no way any of us can ever be just like Christ. If I were to ask you what are the main goals of a Christian life, what would you say? First, of course, is to make certain we're going to heaven, to be saved. And we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that's his gift to us. So you and I have already achieved that primary goal. Jesus said whoever believes in him has eternal life. Not will have, has. It's ours. It's our inheritance that can't be taken away from us. Listen to how Paul describes the blessings that you and I already have in Jesus, in Ephesians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. Through God's gift of Christ, through God's gift of faith in Christ, our goal of eternal life is already guaranteed. All of our spiritual blessings. Others might say, well, if salvation is the primary goal for all people, then the next goal for the Christian life should be to share and spread the gospel so that others can come to faith and salvation in Jesus. And that is the Great Commission, the last instructions Jesus gave to his followers. Go into all the ethnic groups and make disciples. Bring people to salvation so, so there are more people who will follow Christ. So the primary goal is to believe, to be saved through believing in Jesus. The secondary goal is to bring salvation to others who do not yet believe. Is there another goal to the Christian life? I believe there is. I believe the Bible teaches us a third critical goal of the Christian life, Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. The goal of every day living and becoming a little bit more like Jesus. To the congregation in Corinth, Paul wrote, you all, you believers, are being transformed into Christ's likeness that you reflect to the world. He uses the example of Moses and how Moses' face glowed and reflected God's glory after he came down off of the mountaintop. Likewise, Paul is saying that you and I are being transformed into Christ's likeness so that we too can reflect God's glory to the world around us. Now, brothers and sisters, we do not walk in Christ's likeness for our own sake. We want to walk in Christ's likeness so that people will see the glory of Christ reflected in us and, and through us. 
In Romans 8, Paul says of believers that God predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. God predestined us from the very beginning that we would be conformed to the likeness of his Son. So how do we learn to walk in Christ-likeness? Well, we certainly have the book learning, right? The scriptures. There are a lot of biblical passages on what it means to live and walk in Christ. Here's an example from Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. He's speaking to, to you and me, to us, to believers. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rape, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. However, Paul also knew that besides having the instructions, besides having the learning, besides having taken the course, we still need examples to follow. And so even after Paul had written all these things to the church members at Corinth, Paul says, look, just imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, if the goal is Christ-likeness, why didn't Paul just say imitate Christ? Well, you might as well tell a beginning guitar student, these were new believers, you might as well tell a beginning guitar student to be like Eric Clapton. That's who you ought to be like. And they would say, no way, there's no way I could ever play like him. It would be defeating and frustrating. I mean, every week after you come in and you're twanging your way through happy birthday to you and the instructor yells, no, 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 do it like Eric would. And then you give up. You might as well tell a 10-year-old little leaguer, hey, just imitate Hank Aaron or Mookie Betts. Not, that's too far above where a 10-year-old is to even begin to conceive of what that means. You might as well tell a high school basketball player to imitate LeBron or to be like Mike. You might as well tell a preacher to just preach like Luther or Spurgeon. You might as well drag an aspiring artist into the Sistine Chapel, point at the ceiling and say, there, just be like Michelangelo. We would not encourage anyone to grow as an artist if we said, look, that's the standard. But we can say to the young artist, find an artist that's better than you are. Find someone who's a little bit further down the road to being an artist and imitate them. That's one of the reasons our seminary training to become a pastor includes a year called Vicarage. That's a year of no classes, but you go to a congregation and you serve under an experienced pastor for that year. My first attempt to learn or to try to learn how to be a good pastor was to watch and learn from the pastor at my assigned Vicarage church. I will never preach like Billy Graham, but one day I would be, love to be able to preach like Pastor Rich, my supervisor. One day, I would love to have just as much passion for reaching the lost as he does. One day, I would love to lead a congregation to boldly do whatever it takes to reach the unchurched as he led his congregation. He is just a simple parish pastor in Indiana. But he's my example of powerful, effective preaching, consuming love for the lost sheep, and courageous leadership in following the Great Commission. One of the best ways to get closer to being like Jesus is to find someone we can see, we can talk to, that we can follow, 
Someone who has been striving to be like Jesus and is a little bit further along than where we are. And then to imitate that person as he or she imitates Christ. Find someone who's a little bit further down that road and imitate them, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, an older Christian. When I was younger, I had my youth group leader and a local pastor, both of whom I watched, and and I wanted to follow Jesus just as, as those two godly men did. The goal is to walk in Christ-likeness. And one of the primary ways we do so is to find a Christian who's a little bit further down that road and imitate him or her. Every Christian should have a mentor. You are never so holy and so sanctified that you can't benefit from imitating another Christ-like believer. If you think you don't need to be mentored and you've got everything down, well, maybe find someone with Christ-like humility that you can imitate, huh? Pastor told Timothy to be an example to other believers in word, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And he says, Timothy, give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Be an example. Let others learn to be Christ-like by observing the progress you have made. And he tells the older women in the church to disciple the younger ones. Because not only are we called to find someone a little bit further down the road and imitate them, we are also called to be a Christ-like example to others to all others, but especially to what the Bible calls weaker or newer brothers and sisters in the faith. The most loving person in a Bible class should be the teacher. The most Christ-like people in a congregation should be the staff and the board of directors and the elders. In love, in faith, in purity, in word and deed, says Paul, be an example to the other believers. The greatest compliment a Christian can have is another Christian wanting to follow their example as they follow Jesus. My oldest son, Thomas, this is an excellent part of his ministry. He has mentored several young people to come to know Christ, to know what to believe, and to begin to learn how to believe and to live as a Christian. He invited them to church to start with. He would sit with them when they came or even pick them up and go go with them. Then he would invite them to meet weekly for lunch and just begin answering their questions about about Jesus and about the Bible. And then he would invite them to a service event or a Bible study. And so he was mentoring their growth till they got to the point where they stood up and confessed their faith and were baptized. Every Christian, whether we like it or not, every Christian is an example of Jesus to others, to our children, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, and to others around the church, the question is, what kind of an example are we? Be careful. Be careful how you criticize or complain. Be careful how you gossip or talk about others. Be careful how you act and how you speak because you represent Christ. You are to be a pattern of Christ-likeness to others. It was a little boy And his dad was a simple factory worker who had been poor and destitute. And the dad worked very hard, but they didn't have very much. And certainly his dad was not on the high stratus of society. But the boy's dad prayed with the little boy often. He read the Bible to the little boy daily. So one day, the little boy's Sunday school teacher was giving a class, and she asked them a quiz. She said, I'm going to describe someone, and you tell me who this is. She says he was born all alone to two teenage parents. His parents were very poor. He grew up to be a man who was always loving others, a man who was always kind, a man who was always helping others, and a man who loved God all his life. Who was he? And the little boy said, I know. That's my daddy. Two powerful principles that God uses for all believers as we struggle to the ultimate goal of being like Christ. One, imitate another. Find someone who's farther down the line in loving and living like Jesus and imitate them. 
And then two, be careful to be a Christ-like example to others so that you can mentor others closer to Jesus. And then finally, when will we reach the goal? When will we become Christ-like? In heaven, John writes, when we see him, we will be like him. Scripture says that Jesus will present us faultless before God the Father. Until that day, we will sin. Until that day, we will fall short. But one day, set free from our sinful flesh, we'll be transformed into true Christ-likeness. May it be so, O Lord. Amen. I want to share with you the words of a, a song that's pretty popular out there right now. And if you want to listen to it, you can, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. It's called Less Like Me, uh, and it's by Zach Williams. The song's titled Less Like Me. He says, Oh, I have days when I lose the fight, try my best, but I don't get it right. Where I talk a talk that I don't walk and miss the moments right before my eyes. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have held, when I just can't see past myself. Oh Lord, help me be a little bit more like mercy, a little bit more like grace, a little bit more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, and a little less like me. Yeah, there's no denying I have changed because I've been saved from who I used to be. But even at my best, I must confess, I still need help to see the way the Lord sees. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have held, and I just can't see past myself. Oh, Lord, help me to be a little bit more like Jesus and a little bit less like me. I want to feed the beggar on the street, love to be your hands and your feet, freely give what I receive, Lord help me be. I want to put you first above all else and love my neighbor as myself, even in the moments no one sees, Lord help me be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. Let us pray. Father, we pray, help us to be a little bit more like Jesus so that we can reflect his glory and grace and mercy to those around us and so that we can also um, guide and mentor others as they walk the journey with us. And Lord, each of us want to thank you for those people who have been in our lives, who have mentored us in our Christian faith. We all have them, Lord. We all have them. Please let everyone take a moment today and just thank the Lord for someone who was a a mentor or an example of Christ in your life and, and give God thanksgiving for that person. And then be inspired each day to just think about, think about your actions, your attitudes, Think about each situation as you come across it and ask the Lord to help you deal with it, not in your own flesh, but to deal with it in a Christ-like spirit. Lord, bless our efforts to be like Jesus so that Jesus can be glorified to the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We will join together in the Lord's Prayer as we typically do. So pray with me at home if you would. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and fill you with his peace. Amen. Pray that the Lord will bless and watch over you and give you good health. 
uh, and protection and care throughout this coming week so that you can join us again next Sunday um, prayerfully to be blessed by the word of God. Thank you.